Good evening. I'm Kevin O'Hare, Director of the Royal Ballet, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this insight on Wayne McGregor's three-act ballet, Wolf Works. And I'm really specially delighted to welcome all of you out there worldwide watching us via our live stream on YouTube. So Wolf Works is based on the life of Virginia Woolf and her writings and was premiered here at the Royal Opera House in 2015 and it was a highlight of that season. So I'm delighted that I'm bringing it back for its first revival this season. So what are we going to see tonight? We're going to see Wayne McGregor rehearse with his assistant Amanda Isles and Mara Galeazzi and Matthew Ball. We've got Professor Margaret Reynolds. We'll be talking to dramaturg Uzma Hamid about the woman who inspired the ballet. We're really fortunate to have Max Richter, the composer, here with his quartet, and they're going to play extracts from the ballet. We're also going to hear Max and Wayne in conversation about how this collaboration really came to life. And we're also going to see Royal Ballet dancers Edward Watson, Akane Takada, and Tristan Dyer perform an excerpt from the ballet. Wolfworks is on stage from the 21st of January here at the Royal Opera House, and it's going worldwide to cinemas to one near you on the 8th of February. Okay, trailer play. For tickets to come and see Wolf Works here at the Royal Opera House or to find the nearest cinema to see it live on the 8th of February, please look at our website. And also, if you want to tweet us with our thoughts about this evening, do so on uh, hashtag ROHWolf. Now, please welcome Wayne McGregor and Amanda Isles. Hi, hello to you both. Hello, thank you. So, Wayne, we're going to talk with you and Max later. Yeah. But first of all, we're going to see a rehearsal. So can you tell us a little bit about how you and Amanda work and how the process is when you're in the rehearsal period? So we're super lucky at the um, Royal Ballet that we have full-time notators working with us in the studio. And you know that dance is a very um, collaborative art form. And one of the unsung heroes of dance making are the notators. And I thought it would be really nice for us to get an insight into what is notation, what do notators do, and how do they kind of recreate the work when the choreographer's not in the room. And so this is Amanda, the brilliant notator that I've been lucky enough to have in um, my rehearsals for years and years now. She's like a kind of a married couple often. <laughs> and we, we laughed the other day, we were sat um, uh, watching um, a studio call and we both at the same time gave exactly the same notes in exactly the same intonation. It was very funny. Um, so today, um, Amanda's going to um, rehearse the dancers and share with you a little bit about notation. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to explain a little bit because people often say to me, or oh, notation isn't that just for sort of ballet and, you know, nutcracker, the nutcracker form of ballet. And, um, and they sort of puzzled as to how I could possibly notate Wayne's movement. And the thing is, movement, in the same way that choreographic movement has evolved and developed over many years, notation as a language has evolved and developed as well. And we have a huge body of information that we can capture in the notation. And working with Wayne, which is a fascinating process, I always feel it's a little bit like a, like a sculptor who starts with a kind of wire frame and build. You build layers and layers. And when you end up with the finished product, you don't, those individual layers are not discernible, but they are nevertheless essential to that finished product. And what I'm trying to capture in the notation is those layers so that we don't lose that detail. Wayne is incredibly detailed when he's creating, gives the dancers a huge amount of information. And so for me, it's a real pleasure to be able to input to that, um, that depth of information into when we're working with an alternate cast, when we come, when we come back to a piece. Um, on its second viewing, as it were, and we have alternate casts, new casts, it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to sort of give them all those layers of information. Because it's and really important, isn't it? Because also, what Wayne, maybe sometimes Wayne forgets, maybe, I don't know. Never. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're always there to say, no, this is the step, it started on this foot, or it started with this arm, or this, yeah. you know, so you can give We, we call Amanda 
Man's police. <laughs> but also with Wayne's work, it's very much the, the, the energy, the, the direction of the energy is a very important thing. And so with the notation, you can capture that very easily. With notation, you have kind of three elements of the information. You have what the body is doing. You have the relation of that movement to the music or the sound. And then you have your relationship in space and to the other people on stage. And so the sort of the way your energy is directed and how that interacts with everybody else, you can very easily put into the score. So um, it's, a, it's a great tool to have in the studio. And it's, uh, it's lovely that Wayne appreciates it so much. So yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good kind of collaboration. It's a good synergy, I think, Brilliant. between us. So, so we'll see you in action. Yes. There we are. So go. I'm going to work with Mara and Matt, who are the, a new cast to the production this time round. Um, Mara is doing the role that was created on Alessandra Ferry, and Matt is doing a role that was created on Ed Watson. You'll see Ed a little bit later. Um, but what's lovely about having two very instinctive artists is that we can, we can work on it. I'm trying to keep all those details, all those layers there and active, but it's also very much about finding their way of doing it so that we keep the energy going in the right direction as well. So what I'm going to do with these two is we're just going to have a little talk. We, we have already rehearsed this, um, and there's just we're at the point now where there's just a few details we need to clean up. So I want to just have a look at a few things, and then we're going to run it with the music. So this is a section um, where Mara and Matt are individual. Mara is, is representing Clarissa from Mrs. Dalloway, and Matt is Septimus. But they, their relation, they're really just facets of, of their own madness and discomfort. It's a very uncomfortable passage, and it's quite frantic. Um, but our challenge is to get that sense of it being frantic without losing the clarity of the movement. Um, so let's just go. So Matt, go to where you are down here, where you finish with the previous section. So let's just walk through it, because there's a few things I need to have a look at. So we're going around. So it's like you almost, you sense each other, but you're not looking at each other. So keep going round, make it a little, accelerate it a little bit, accelerate, accelerate, more turn on yourself, and ya cha cha, and through, hua, and then turn, ha, round you go, hua, cha cha, yeah, so Matt, make a little bit more of, so from here, we need to see, from having your arms really on top, you need to really rotate her arms, and then, so you're really open, we need to see the arteries, that's it. And then Mara, it's you that comes back through, that's it. Now slam, pop, pop, yeah, so Matt, you should be doing that as well. You're also doing that, yeah? Let her initiate it, but you need to respond to it. So you go, yeah, cha, 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 second one, cha, cha, cha. Yeah, so Matt, go to third, that's it. So we get this echoing, so you're really in line with her arm, that's it. So then you go, whoa, slow, 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 slow. Yeah, cha, 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 cha. One, ha, ha, yeah. So there needs to be a nice moment there. So after you've done the cabriole lift, Matt, um, you, also, you again need to be, it's like you're containing her there. So have, have your arm, this time, on the top of hers in the third. So just do from where you do the cabriole lift. So you go cabriol lift and down, ch ch that's it. So then she wants to escape from there and ha, ha, back she goes, up, ha, ha, and through, that's it. So both, we both need to be trying to do this board, but hang on, sorry, I just need to check this because I wanted to check in the school <laughs> because I want to check this arm. Yes, we should be going, we should be going. <laughs> so both of you from here, you want to grab this one through. We need to go up before it goes forward. So although it's really quick for you, Matt, because you need to get hold of her, we still should be going, try and go up as well from here. So you go down, up, and then through. Yep, that's it, yeah. So try, just try that together so you can get the coordination. So you go reach, grab it, drop it, lift, and through. That's it, yeah, and off. We we'll, won't we'll really control it, go and accelerate, get faster, get faster, get faster, get faster, and in, yeah, cha, 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 cha. Good. So just one second. So Mara, do you, what do you need from Matt there? I feel like you need to be a little bit more stable so you can really get contact with the head. I think, yeah. I think it's probably just the angle that yeah. we finish. Just try the promenade, Matt. So like from... So she's in and the. This is very hard I know it's hard. This is very. I asked Mara to wear the coat because without it, it's quite easy. But with it, it makes a difference. So this is what we need to deal with. So round you go. So keep her off balance, off balance. Bring her in. So there's this moment here. That's better. Yes, yes, yes. And then ch ch away. And round you go. Ha. Huh? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so underneath, on top, that's it. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. So let's just fix this. Yeah. Up. So I think it works better if, uh, so, the f so from here, the first one is Matt initiating that Sutanu. Yeah. And then the second one, I think it's better if you do it, Mara. So Matt's doing that sheer over the top. Now, Mara, that's it. You initiate it so he can get underneath. Then you pull back and go. Ha, ha, ha. And go. That's it. Ha, ha. Get into the pit. Round you go. And pulling the hair away. Good, 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 good. Round away. Round you go. Ha. Huh? Round. What, what, yeah, so we need to fix this, don't we? So, Matt, you need to be changing the grip as you go. Where are we? Where are we? Yeah, so from, yes, from, um, once you, you're here, Matt, so you go round. So you want to keep, you want to keep what's your upstage arm now, and it's the other arm that is snaking it's round. Nice, it's flatter, yes, yeah, come a little bit flatter. So Mara's staying on that leg, so you need to come around her, make sure she gets croisée. So this, you need to get right underneath with that leg, that's it. Then bring her and now change. Yes, yes, and then they're good. Flip. Up, good, lovely. Release the leg and through and push and ha, lovely. Up, passe, down, turn, hua, hua, ha, and round, round. Keep it speedy, keep it speedy, and ya, cha, cha, yeah, good. So what we want, I think you need to, you're traveling a little bit too far, Matt, on the drag, but it needs to be quicker, yeah, tighter and quicker. Otherwise, you might, you're, you, have to, you have to accelerate it a bit to catch the end of the music for the back bend. Um, I think, Mara, from here, don't take too big a step out, because it's quite hard for him to come with you. Just, just try the, from, the, from the drop, so, Matt, you can get that spin. Huh, that's it, round you go, round you go, round you, not too high, not too high, now let her come down, cha, 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 oh, that's it, that's better, yeah, through. So now you just need to make sure, get her back on her feet, <laughs> right her, she'll take the coat off, and away, so you've got about six seconds here, Matt, yep, so you'll have a blackout there, so you have time to go over, Mara will come to centre, and then you've got a complete change of mood. So as the lights come up, you want to feel that you're already moving. Yeah, so you're moving slowly towards her. So now we have the feeling that she's just, she's now really lost all her strength. Yeah, so take a little bit longer there, Matt. So when you take the hand, initially, you need to see, it's like you're checking to see if there's any damage on her wrist. You're, that's it. And then, yeah, before you take it up, and fifth, it's like, will she have the strength? Uh -huh. And through. Then let her weight come forward a little bit. And diagonal, good. Really like, you, you don't know where you are. And drop, that's nice. Steady her, steady her. And then see if she can stand on her own. Give her space. And squeeze up. And through, yeah, so Matt, you need to try and, you need to, that's, that needs to be more convincing because it looks like Mara's doing the passe, really, <laughs> really lifted up. It's like she's lost, she's lost all her strength. So from here, I'd pull her up and then pull it. That's still, it's better if you having, you have the grip here, I think. Okay. So it's, yeah, just try it. Yes, that's it. So you're pushing it, that's better. Round. Take it and... Is she going to stay? No. That's nice, Mara. Good. Huh? And oh. what? <laughs> so. I, I <laughs> Sorry, Matt. That's all right. That's what he's here for. So drop. That's it. Good. And so cheer. And then just little scoop. Ha ha ha. That's good. Put her down. Pa pa. And let him do this to the arms, Mara. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So then you're going to walk away, Matt. No. And it's really like, it's like taking her to the window to see a different view, to see if that's going to make a difference. No. Come back in, move her again. Completely passive, Mara. Huh? Is that any better? No. And a little bit more frustrated as you go. And a little bit more active now, Mara, with that leg and up, drop. And down, through. OK, so this is the one. So from, from the first one, Matt, she needs to go back onto point, yeah, so that she can do the second arabesque. Maybe I'm doing too much with my back. 
legs. I think from you almost want to feel like you're tipping out sideways. The, the image of this, when, when Wayne first did it, the image of this was like you were in, lying in bed, and then it's almost like you fall out of bed. So you want to just go sideways, Mara, rather than down. So flat, and now just come sideways, and uh, that's better. Yum. Through, up. Now you want to drop down in the center. One, two, through. Good, good, good. And up. See if she can go alone. Good. No. And bring her up. Let her drop to the floor. It's like she disappears out of your arms. That's beautiful. Down. And then palm. Let me lift. Good. That's lovely, Mara. Uh, roll her. And then up. And that last lift. OK. Great. OK. So let's try it with the music. Let's try it with the music. So I need to just, let me just find, get the track. So guys, we really need to show that contrast between that the absolute agitation and the, that, that really scratchy feeling of nothing, for, and then the complete, ugh, like nothing. And you're much more conciliatory on that, that second one. So, right. Um, so we are going 22, 49. So this is just before the walk, OK? So this is, um, obviously, we normally, um, most of the time we use pianists, but for this rehearsal process, we're using a, a um, sound, an audio file, which I have to say is the demo, <laughs> the demo file. OK, so this is just the end, Matt. OK, so go. Good, speed it up, speed it up, go. Sure, lovely. Ha, ha. Yeah. Ha. Now slow. Ha, ha. Up, down, close it in, up. Yeah, sure, ha. Catch her, good. Ha. Round. That's great. Thread it through, that's it. Now switch. Good. Okay, that's great. We're just we're about two seconds late, so just carry on. Okay, just hold on one sec. I'm just gonna just stop for just a second. Okay, so just where we are. Yeah. We just, we just need to speed up that very last bit. So I'm just going to take it back a couple of seconds. Oops. OK, we're perfect. That's us. OK.
Good, that's great. Good, very good, excellent. Very, very good, yeah. Thank you, guys, really good, thank you. That was great, that's much better. Good, thank you very much, thank you. Right, oh, sorry, I've left it playing. Right. That's a... Huge thanks, huge thanks to Amanda. I think we can all see how brilliantly clear she is, not only with steps, but also the intent that was Wayne's original vision, and then passing that on to an alternate cast of Mara Galeazzi and Matthew Ball. And from watching that, I can't wait to see them in performance. I think it's gonna be really wonderful. So thank you both for being part of this, and Amanda. So, of course, Virginia Woolf was one of the foremost writers of the 20th century. And so I'm delighted to have Professor Margaret Reynolds talking with Uzma Hamid about Virginia Woolf. And then later on, she will talk with Max and Wayne about their collaboration and how the score came to life. So please welcome Margaret and Uzma. Thank you, Kevin. Um, well, it's wonderful to see this uh, in rehearsal and uh, in this way. Um, and Uzma and I are going to talk about how you translate a writer like Virginia Woolf to the stage, to the dance, how you make it into a completely different artwork. Um, Uzma, I came to see this when it was premiered in 2015. Um, partly because I'm interested in, in dance and contemporary ballet in particular, but also because as a literary person, um, the idea of taking a writer like Virginia Woolf and translating her into a completely different art form really intrigued me. Um, and it's not an, the, the, these aren't narratives. You'd be, you'd be mad if you read Virginia Woolf for the story. Um, <laughs> I think it would be incredibly hard work. So you had to start with an abstract. Um, so what was it about Wolf that made her an attractive subject for a ballet? I think it's exactly that. I think you've put your finger on it. There is a, a tension in Wolf, isn't there, between narrative and abstract. Um, she was very interested in trying to find out how much she could sort of almost stretch what fiction and what literature could be made to do, um, and how with just a very little narrative detail you could form a scaffolding almost, mm -hmm. onto which you could hang deeper truths, which were often about internal states of mind or um, glimpses of the sort of mystical, grander states of the universe around us. Um, and I think that, that, that spoke very naturally to Wayne's work, which is also very concerned with um, trying to bring out those inner states, trying to create work that moves emotionally and also makes people think um, that provides wonderful triggers to feeling so that the audience can actually find a personal way into the work mm -hmm. rather than being led by a sort of plot-driven um, Absolutely. Narrative. I mean, an example here is we've just, we've just seen with um, Matt and Mara's performance um, rehearsal 
is that, uh, you know, in Mrs. Dalloway, in Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, Septimus and Clarissa never actually meet. Um, the only thing, if you remember the novel, is that Septimus is wandering around London as Clarissa Dalloway is wandering around London. And at the end, when she gives her party, um, the news of Septimus's suicide is something that she hears there. And yet, psychically, they're entwined. So to see them together like that really works, doesn't it? I mean, it works with... You, you, when we were talking about this beforehand, um, Uzma said to me that one of the things that uh, she was very concerned to bring out was the experience of actually reading Virginia Woolf. So how do you do that? How do you replicate our experience of reading a novel on the stage in a ballet? Well, I think you, you probably don't try to replicate. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what we were very keen to do. We were very aware that, as you say, when you read with Virginia Woolf, it's all about feeling. Um, hmm. She's worked very hard to create a world that you just become immersed in, um, so that rather than feeling like you're standing outside it or you're an onlooker, you're actually inside it. The colours are very vivid, the sounds are very deep and rich, um, and everything is very heightened. Um, so when we came to uh, bring the work to the stage, we were really looking at creating those equivalents. And obviously in staging, we have all sorts of other different devices at our disposal. Um, and as you rightly point out, that duet between Septimus and Clarissa never happens in the, in the novel. They don't meet. Um, but yet it's a gift of something that we can do on the stage, that we can create that moment where he invades her mind and almost seduces her to commit, to commit suicide herself, mm. that we can make a duet of that um, and make it something that comes to life in that way. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, Virginia Woolf has not a huge oeuvre, um, but there are quite a few novels to choose from. So I, I, I can see why you mightn't go for the years, or, <laughs> obviously, or, or any of the early novels like The Voyage Out or Night and Day. But how, you know, so these three, Mrs. Dalloway, Orlando and The Waves, how were those three settled on? What was attractive about those three? Well, I think it's that they're very different. I mean, you could say that about all her work, really, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, um, she's an yeah, amazing writer every, from that point yeah. of view. She's always experimenting with new things, isn't she? That's yeah. right. Um, and we started with Mrs Dalloway, and Wayne very quickly pointed out that if we're going to do a ballet about Virginia Woolf, it would be wrong to do one thing because she never is one thing and as you've just said she was constantly moving constantly trying to find different ways of expressing realities and different voices and different devices um, so so then we arrived at Orlando and the waves the waves being of course the most poetic of her novels and Orlando being a, an example almost of science fiction or magical realism yeah. something that's so kind of extravagant and out there and flamboyant. Um, yes, because I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure you all remember, but Orlando is the novel which um, Virginia Woolf was, was a sort of love letter to Peter Sackville West. So Orlando starts as a man in the 16th century and round about the 18th century sort of wakes up as a woman and it comes right forward into the 20th century. So as you say, it's, it's magical transformations mm. within it all the time. Yes. Mm. So within those three, there's, there's such a diversity of voice and um, yet, in a way, they, they all speak to each other as a whole evening's work, or, you know, that's what you, we intended. You could, they, they all, uh, I mean, I was also intrigued, and, and of course it's very important to remember, you know, these ballets aren't called Mrs. Dalloway, Orlando and the Waves, they're called I Now, I Then, uh, Becomings and Tuesday, so separating it in that way. Becomings and Orlando, how does that, you know, <laughs> yes, well, transformations, becomings, I suppose, new things, inventions. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were keen that we really try and get to the core of what each of these novels is about, really try and boil down to the essence um, of what, they, what they're really saying. And becomings, we felt, it's obviously, Orlando is obviously the most linear of Wolf's novels in a way, isn't it? It's this sort of, as you say, a mad mm. dash through time <laughs> and as, as she goes through three centuries. And it's also very full of exterior detail, um, particularly period detail, um, which helps to give a sense of that journey through time. Um, it's not really what dance is best at. We don't really want a lot of exterior, you know, paraphernalia mm. on the stage. Um, cluttering it and, and reducing that swiftness and that sense of immediacy. Um, but what we can get to very well is the abstract states that are underlying Orlando. 
And one of those, obviously, is this incredible plasticity of gender that you see and that she's playing with in that novel, um, with not only the transformation of Orlando herself, but all the general gender confusion and cross-dressing and yes. very sort of Shakespearean <laughs> madness. Yeah, that... Even at the very beginning, um, the character of Orlando meets this Russian princess, Sasha. And to begin with, she's dressed as a boy, isn't exactly, she? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and towards the end of the novel, she says, doesn't she, that actually, as you're traveling through time very fast, the self goes through a process of almost being chopped up very fine, like, and she, she uses an image of little pieces of paper being torn up and, and thrown mm. into the air. Um, and so that was something that we picked on and that we can do very well in dance, is actually showing that splintering of self into many genders, many selves, many possibilities, something that's always evolving. Um, and likewise, time is a big sort of backdrop of the novel. You know, what, what we see is Orlando racing through time, but obviously what sits behind that is the hugeness of the universe and the smallness of, of mm. the human project in front of it. And so that's really what, what Becomings was about. It was about, um, you know, people becoming, but also the universe continually evol evolving, evolving uh -huh. and the way that human life within that is nothing but a flash in the pan. Um, and I read yes. somewhere, I'm sure you can tell us a bit about this, but I read somewhere that um, before the turn of the, the, the century, there were very few, there were about four books written about insects, and by the, by the time of the 1920s, there was something like 136. Because these, these discoveries were coming out, you know, from astronomy and cosmology about the size. So there's the smallness yes. of, 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 of the universe, but then the hugeness at the same time. Exactly, and you see yeah. insects all over Wolf, don't you? There's always yeah. spiders, butterflies, um, dragonflies. Well, and it's um, why it's why interestingly Wolf is such a good subject for a ballet because you know she's at that cusp of the beginnings of, of new technologies which are now become so familiar to us you know if you think about photography film the the car in Mrs Dalloway the aeroplane in Mrs Dalloway all of these things so you know to be using those and translating them into the the dazzling you know effects of um, particularly in Becomings, is, yes. is um, yes. something that's... Well, yeah. I actually didn't realise, because I'm not very knowledgeable about science fiction, but it turns out that the science fiction world considers Wolf to be one of the people who, you know, almost began the genre, one of the people who started to explore mm. um, in that direction by trying to bring these emerging um, insights from, you know, cosmology and science into her work. So... I mean, it doesn't surprise me. She was a first in so many things, but it is, it's yet another amazing thing about yes, her. Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and even in the writing, you know, there are, there are all sorts of kind of filmic techniques or, or performance techniques that are so familiar to us, like doubling, like, um, uh, um, you know, uh, flashbacks um, and, and close-ups and all these phrases that we now have from different kinds of art forms and yet she puts them into her narratives, yeah. Um, let's talk a bit about, uh, about Tuesday, about the, the, la the, the third piece. Um, so this is based on the waves, so six characters talking, kind of going from childhood through to possibly to old age, certainly to middle age, with the waves always in the background. Um, it is the most poetic novel, so how do you move that poetry from her text into, into performance? Well, weirdly, in, in fact, you know, it's, it's actually not that difficult to move poetry into dance, is it? Because it is <laughs> abstract. So in a way, you know, when we first came to approach that, we thought that would be the most abstract of the, of the evening's acts. Um, but as we explored more and more the, the, the language of Wolf and particularly her relationship with the imagery of water, it yes. became almost impossible to do that piece without really bringing Wolf's journey into it. And of course, when you start talking about the, the journey that the children go on in the waves from childhood through adolescence, through young adulthood, middle age, and as you say, old age and facing death, um, it, it almost seems that Wolf is commenting about her own life as well mm. um, and how we come to terms with our own mortality. I mean, she says at one point, doesn't she, that she doesn't believe in aging. She believes in forever altering one's aspect to the sun. She says these are the changes of the soul. Um, and she was also very interested in, in the idea of the writer in the work, I think. Mm. Um, contrary to her predecessors, she wasn't interested in presenting a kind of realism that pretended to be 
complete and truthful with an omniscient narrator outside it. She wanted us to question, who's saying this? Whose truth is this? Who's creating this order for us and telling us that this is actually reality? Um, so it made a lot of sense for us to, to bring her into that work mm. um, and to talk about her own journey into the water as yeah. we looked at the waves as a symbol of... Because two things strike me about that. Um, one is that... I, I hadn't actually thought about it until I saw Tuesday, um, that this image of the waves, it not only permeates the waves, you know, as in the novel, but actually runs through all her work, doesn't it? Mm. Um, even in Mrs. Dalloway, I, I don't know if you remember, but there's this fantastic passage where Mrs. Dalloway goes home, having bought her flowers, you know, like the first line, and she sits and she mends the green dress that she's going to wear at the party Beautiful that passage, night. It's an yeah. amazing mm. passage. Do look it up, everybody. Um, where she sits and she's sewing and everything becomes very, very quiet. And she thinks, this is life. You know, the wave collects and falls, collects and falls. And then she has this extraordinary image, which is sort of prescient of her own future or non-future, a death of the swimmer being far out and only hearing things far distant. And I, th I thought that image, though it's from Mrs. Dalloway, comes across beautifully in, yes. in Tuesday. Yes, I, I think, as you rightly say, this image of water is absolutely prevalent. Mm. And also, conversely, air and birds and fish. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, a the, whole the, cosmology, you yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. The, there is that sort of uh, opposition between air and water, I think. And there's another passage towards the end of Mrs. Dalloway where I think it's Peter who's thinking about the self and the, the, the sort of real self, the true self, the inner self, um, as a fish that, as Wolf puts it, plies among obscurities. And there's this sort of sense of, um, you know, merging, as water being a symbol of merging, of that place where you can actually forget about relating as yourself to others, but actually just become one and be silent and be part of the whole, mm. as opposed to the air. And the seduction of the air is the, is the mingling and the gossip and the splash on the top of the water and the socialising, as, as, as Peter Walsh is thinking. Um, and so it was that kind of tension between, um, you know, the merging and, and the desire to be conscious and to continue experiencing the, the beautiful things that the world has to offer. And Wolf was so alive to nature that I think we wanted to bring to Tuesday, that we, saw, we see in that her sort of painful farewell to all of these people in her life and also to the idea of consciousness and of relationship and nevertheless the call towards the greater whole and towards this idea of loss of self and the final kind of merging and peace. Because yeah. um, I, I don't know how, how many of you see it. I, you really must. Everybody must see it. Um, but one of the things that's amazing is that you do use Virginia Woolf's own text. You know, we see writing, we hear her voice right at the very beginning, and towards the end we also hear her voice, though not her actual recorded voice, but in her suicide letter, which prefaces Tuesday. I hope I'm not giving too much away. Um, so that the overlap between the waves and her suicide is there. When I came in 2015, I actually came to this with my daughter, who was then 12 and a half. So she knew nothing about Virginia Woolf but just was totally absorbed by the ballet. And I asked her the other day, I said to him, you know, what do you remember? And she came up with various things. And then she said to me, but mostly that it was utterly beautiful. And I tried to, you know, get out of her what it was. And in the end, it seemed to me, I don't know how you feel about this, Osma, that, you know, there's a, there's a little bit in the program now where one of your viewers, readers, says, the thing about Virginia Woolf is that she makes you realize that actually you never know anybody except yourself, except that through art, you know, we get a glimpse of Virginia Woolf, we get a glimpse of Wayne, we get a glimpse of you, we get a glimpse of all the dancers. So those connections are made. I'm wondering if that is why it seems so troubling, but consoling in a strange way as well. Well, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautifully put, and I think it's a <laughs> tremendous shame that people often, or Woolf has this reputation of being difficult or, yeah. or obscure, because actually... The work is so immediate and so visceral and so, you know, you are plunged into that world whether you like it or not, no matter how much you try to retain a distance. And that's something, you know, she did say the book is, is not form which you see but emotion which you feel. And that was our kind of mantra throughout this piece. We kept coming back to that every time we had to make a difficult choice about what to keep in and what to lose. Um, because, of course, it's difficult to do these incredible novels within one act each. Um, and... 
naturally, we're, we're very much helped um, by all the amazing collaborators that we can bring to staging. So we have um, Max's incredible music that really gets mm. to the heart of it in the way that, you know, Virginia Woolf envied in music. Um, and in fact, she feels that writing and music are very near allies, but uh, she writes that writing is degenerate because it's forgotten its allegiance to music. So, yeah. you know, bringing and out that, put that the natural rhythms again. and the melodies of her, of her text, yes. um, that, that's been... Well, that's, really that's kind of exactly where we're going to go um, and think about the music and the way that that relates to, to these ballets and to the transformation of Virginia Woolf. Um, thank you very much, Uzma Hamid. And now... Uh, remember that we want to hear from you tonight, so please don't forget to tweet your thoughts to uh, using the hashtag ROHWolf. Um, there is actually also um, a digital program for WolfWorks available free from the Royal Opera House website. So go to roh.org.uk slash publications and use the code in capitals FREEWOLF. So now... We are going to hear from Max Richter and his score for Wolfworks and the quartet, and they're going to be performing in the garden from Wolfworks. Max. <laughs>
thank you to Max Richter and his quartet for that wonderful performance of In the Garden from Wolfworks. Um, it's such a fantastic, well, it's all fantastic music. Um, so now, please welcome back Max Richter and Wayne McGregor. Thank you. That was lovely. Yeah, amazing. The whole thing's amazing. The music is so beautiful. Um, Wayne, when you were talking to Amanda earlier, um, yeah. rehearsing Max and Mara, you, you said that ballet is a very collaborative art form. You two have collaborated quite a lot together. We have. Yeah. Yeah, we're super lucky. So What's so special about that? What is it about collaboration and working together that? Well, means I mean, I think so I've much. been lucky enough to work on, I think, five new productions of Max's, well, with Max, with new music. And it's such a gift to have a, a composer to work with in real time. I mean, it's a phenomenal kind of transaction of energy. And if I can just say just before, um, Max has to hide his ears while I say this, I think, <laughs> you know, one of the, the wonderful things that draws me to uh, Max's music is this incredible uh, ability he has to kind of tap into all of our kind of memories of, of past, future, present, all at the same time. These evocations that give you kind of a, a space and an openness in which already you want to move. Um, they're kind of um, amazing kind of cues to experience that kind of sit somewhere really deep within the body. And you can't help but feel um, that music in 3D. Um, and so anything I ever get from Max, is really incredible. It's fine it's by part, you. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not that. It's the, it, it, the, the difficulty is that there's always some incredible eloquence in everything, and it's how is it that you um, have this kind of embarrassment of riches, and what do you do with it, and how can you develop it into something that will work um, in a direction that we're all sharing. So that's adding in to your ideas, even in the process. Well, I how think we work in parallel. So oh, okay. um, I think that's one of the beautiful. So things. How, what happens when you start working on something together? <laughs> Um, there isn't really a, a set process, actually. D um, is it different each time? It just depends on the particular yes, work? Yes. Uh, I mean, I feel like it's a, a voyage of discovery. That's really what it is. And that's what's so beautiful about working with Wayne, actually, this sort of sense of um, curiosity. Hmm. We're making something, and we don't yet know what it is, and we're moving out into an unknown space. But it's a sort of enjoyable series of discoveries and experiments. That's what's, uh, that's what's very exciting about it. So just to, to ask you a question about Wolfworks, um, Wayne, we've t I've talked to Uzma about Virginia Woolf. What, what was she to you? What, what gave you the germ of this idea in the first place? Well, I think that, you know, that um, I think part of the attraction is the way in which she kind of um, reinvented form. Mm -hmm. the, the, the idea that she's difficult, often I'm thought of as a difficult When did you first read her, may I ask? Um, I, early, early in, in my school, my school right. life, but you know, then again much later. And then um, this idea that actually, again, in the, in the same way that the poetry was so analogous with dance to me, you know, the rhythmic feeling of, bright, of, of reading, um, the, the unfolding of images, and, and just this idea that actually every sentence you have a, an incredible um, image which is both acoustic and visual and kinesthetic, all colliding mm. at different times. Is that your experience, Max, too, then? Yes, I mean, I think she's a, a fascinating writer for, for other artists to engage with um, because um, there is, there's an enormous amount of space for interpretation. She allows you in. Um, and as Wayne was saying, there are, there are these extraordinary cues, you know, sens sort of sensory cues uh, in the material. I mean, when we were thinking about uh, Dalloway, for example, there's an incredible amount of information of sort of the city, the texture of the city, the smells and sounds and all of that. So it's a very inviting space to sort of walk into with another language uh, and explore that. And when we, were, when we saw Amanda rehearsing Matt, Max and Matt, mm. Matt, Mara and Matt even, yeah. <laughs> um, you, uh, I noticed, uh, I mean, I'm sure everybody here and everybody listening has, has seen the way that you use the cityscape sounds. Yeah the clock sounds, mm -hmm. the Big Ben sounds. Yeah. So that, that opened out that space for you well, in it, terms of the musical They were in coloring. a way the starting point for right. the musical language. Um, uh, for me, one of the overarching images uh, uh, of Dalloway is, is the city itself. And you know all these trajectories through the city, you know, people wandering about through the city. And it has an incredible tempo, actually. Mm. 
And that sort of made me think about time. And then, of course, you know, the image of the clock. Because a lot of it, the book plays in memory and it you know, jumps backwards and forwards. And it just struck me as it's a very powerful sort of seed to kind of get the whole thing moving. And a lot of the music really ticks along. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when, when I read Virginia Woolf as a teenager, I, I was slightly irritated by the repeated line, the leaden circles dissolved in the air of the clock mm, striking. Mm. Now, I feel quite differently. I feel with you, it's a kind of poetic rendering of the music and, and repetition and tempo. It's an interesting yeah. term yeah. that you use there. Yeah. So it's utterly different, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is, yeah. 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 Um, what about the music for the other pieces then? Because the Orlando piece called Becomings, mm. how did you... I, I, I mean, it, I think I, what's interesting about the process of it, it's not as linear as you describe. So it's okay. not like we start on Mrs. Dalloway and then we work, no. you know... Actually, I, I was just thinking, like you're so, right, Wayne, I, I stand corrected. I was just thinking to myself, because I need to ask you, you know, is the music done before you start rehearsing? No, no, right. not at all. Tell me no, about that. At the same time. So, <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, one of the pleasures of working with a, a composer who's alive is that you have the conversation. <laughs> You have the have conversation back yeah. and forth, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think in, in some ways we have a very similar uh, uh, way of working in one respect, and that is that we obviously have read the novels, we're deep in the conversation, we've got a sense of what perhaps the kind of visual world will look like, the design world would look like, and then we start making things, and mm. some of those things might be short, and some of those things might be long-form things, and we're not quite sure yet where they go. Right. And Max will send me stuff, and I'll play some of those stuff in the studio, and I'll make something to it or not to it. And so mm. it's a very kind of... Um, a discursive process where we have we're generating lots of things where we don't know where they're going to go. Right. So you're mm. trying this out on the dancers, yeah. well, and then I'm, going back to Max and yeah, saying, I'm not really trying it out. Well, what I'm doing is bringing painting. Max's world into an environment in which you steep yourself and see what emerges. So what I'm not trying to do is put the music on and okay. dance to the music. I'm going. This is giving me a certain kind of sensory evocation, and from that, it makes the body behave in a particular kind of way. And it's mm. that behaviour that then generates a sense of what yeah. is developed choreographically. Yeah. Yeah. And Max, are you coming? Are you seeing this? This. <laughs> Sometimes I have choreography. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, this this happens sort of in a way behind closed doors. But I've, I yes, I have seen it. Yes. I mean, I think what's interesting is the the way that again, it's experimental. It's really an experimental process. I'll be making some things, and uh, the image I think is when. We, you know when something catches fire. Suddenly it, it takes on a life of its own, an energy of its own, and it starts to feel inevitable, and that's where we should be going. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's really an exciting uh, sort of uh, an exciting moment. And then the material starts to take on a life of its own, doesn't it? it yeah, just, totally. you just then, you, then you're following the material, which is what's wonderful. Because interestingly, listening to that piece in the garden that we, that we just yeah. heard, um, I can see now in my mind's eye the pas de deux that goes with that yeah. piece of music. But actually, I was very struck by the way that you're using the collection of instruments there so that the ensemble of the dancers is there even though they're not actually on stage at the same time. I hope right. I'm... No, no, you're, you're in, absolutely right. You yeah. Know, um, yeah, I mean, it's this single lines, count yeah, single lines, weaving in the violin and the cello. Ways, and, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. weaving is a great kind of, a, kind of an image and what we try to do physically as well is drive these kind of physical characters that left a trace or a trail. And almost we're knitting with these stories and we're yeah. trying to create this kind of incredible um, architecture out of these lines, these threads that develop into some um, beautiful thing um, that passes through time. I think you can really feel that in the music. And mm. it's interesting you, no you notice uh, Max's titles because at some point a title will arrive around a kind of an idea that Max has. Right. And then that all of a sudden populates my imagination in a different way. It always goes, OK, this is giving this a little bit of a, a shape or a little bit of a boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Like the titles for the ballets overall that are just yeah. Draw yeah, drawing us off in different they, directions. In a way, the piece makes itself. Yes. Like, you know, it's funny, I went to, to Max's studio. Max was living in Berlin. and. Uh, uh, at that time, and I went to hear some uh, the material live in the studio with mm. him, and he played me lots of fantastic material. And um, uh, I was there about an hour and a half or so. Then he said, "Oh, I've got something else." And I was thinking I was going to hear a nice mm -hmm. little, you know, mm -hmm. fifteen-second sketch. And then I got basically the whole of Waves, <laughs> thirty minutes of this incredible, <laughs> this incredible. He said, "Oh, it's just a sketch so far." This incredible, um, and really, I, I, I it really, I had to stop my. I mean, I, I'm not somebody who listens to music and bursts out crying. That's not my character. Uh -huh. Um, but there was something that re really caught me so early on in that kind of like that slow building music that I could feel myself welling up. Mm. 
Um, oh, I'm, 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 I'm getting goosebumps now because I can hear that there, music. Right? Yeah, we just, we just didn't, you know, and, and that, and, and Max says, what does that feel like? Is that something we could sustain on stage? And we were like, just absolutely, totally. I think we have to be brave with that and allow yeah. that to unfold over yeah. time. Yeah. Do you know where that came from, Max, then? If well, you had this whole worked out piece? Uh, well, I, I mean, obviously, the waves is, is full of amazing images. And um, already by then, I think we, we had sort of, you know, we had the, the idea of the, the suicide letter. Right. And the, the sort of imprinting of the biography onto that. So it, it, it's really just a set of feelings. Mm -hmm. And really that's what, for me, composing is, is about chasing down those feelings, you know, and trying to articulate those in a way which, mm -hmm. which somehow match up with the listener's experience, the dancer's experiences. Um, so I'm really writing from a set of feelings about that material. Because the other thing with that one is, I mean, obviously you're using a huge variety, not only of mm. instruments, but of sounds and yeah. soundscapes and, yeah. and, and, and beginning with, with the actual sound of the waves there. Yes, yes. And the, the Ravi Deepu's video Amazing. as well. Oh. Yes. But, the, but so it's, it's, did the music kind of come out of the sound of the waves? I it, don't know. It, it feels does. as though it grows organically it out of it. Yes, it, it does. I mean, we, have, we start with just the sound of the waves. Mm. Um, and then um, some musical material, which is, is really the sort of the spine of the, that whole act, yeah. um, which, which has a sort of wave-like contour. Um, and it, that, I guess that sort of mirrors um, this image uh, of the wave itself. Um, and the music is very cyclical, and it speaks to that idea of repetition and rhythm, and, but it works over quite long ranges. You know, it's quite big time spans. And there's a voice. There is a voice, yes. Mm. Um, May I a... ask you? That's me. <laughs> 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 Where did that come from, the voice? Well, I, I thought, I, I, I wasn't sure about it really. Mm. Um, I wanted to use a, vo a wordless voice um, as an instrument, but submerged in this texture. So there is a voice there, um, but she's, she's really, she's sort of in this sort of, sort of numinous cloud of sound, and, and she's sort of half buried. And you've, I think, I wondered about it, because I thought, is this, is this sort of too, are we sort of editorialising too much? Is it too, you know? But I think we felt really that it just, it was right to put her in there. Yeah, totally. It's, it's kind of, for me, it's a total release. There's kind of this release into another dimension. Yeah. It kind of opens up. And I mean, for me, I mean, yes, we're starting with waves, but waves also is sound of silence, sound of inside of your head. Yes, mm. it's, it's or kind putting of the shell to your kind of, ear. Yeah, shell mm. to the ear. Yeah. It's, it's all of that. And, um, and again, I think these sounds of nature are absolutely fundamental to how we experience the world. Yeah. Um, you know, they're right in the core of our bodies. Mm. Um, and I think that's why they connect with not only the dancers, but the people who are watching. Mm. Okay, so we'll, can we just talk a little bit about Becomings then? Because we kind of skipped over that mm. one. So, where, you know, as you're working on this, well, where, where did that music that's came the from? opposite, in a way. We wanted mm. something that was like full on, yeah. very yep. um, spliced, very uh, kind mm. of aggressive. Yeah. Um, you had that, that folio idea. Yeah, yeah. Could you explain what the folio idea was? Yes, well, um, La Folia is a. a I don't think anyone really knows where it comes from. It originated in the 16th century somewhere. It's a dance tune, very well-known tune that very many composers have used to set variations on. Um, obviously, for me, as a musician, when I'm, when I'm reading Orlando, I'm thinking it's, this is a variation form. That's what it is. You know, it's transformations. It's mm -hmm. things being turned so into... So you're m taking the, the literary form and using a musical analogy yes, directly there. Pretty yeah. much, one-to-one. -one, I just thought, well, this is variations. OK, so we can explore different aspects of this by just sort of circling around it using different languages. Um, and there are, I don't know, 20 variations or something, very diverse orchestral music, small instruments, m crazy electronics. It, goes, it really goes everywhere. <laughs> in the way that the novel goes everywhere. Yes. <laughs> and we love yeah. that idea of it being kind of very uncontrolled, that things would compete with one another, mm. something would come into focus, something would submerge back, something mm. would really, fa uh, really in a very fast way come and hit an audience in a direct way, something yeah. would put audiences off. But again, it's all these different landscapes and di different textures in which the body behaves differently. Yeah. And um, it, it was really fun to work with that. It's a, yeah. real, it's a real kind of um, adrenaline bullet 
in a way. Yes. Um, that we <laughs> Which really is actually love. a very good description of the of novel, the novel yeah. Orlando, yeah. isn't it? Because it, is. it? Yeah. You know, it yeah. just Relative. hits you over and over yeah. again between the eyes, yeah. yes. I mean, I, I said to Uzma that one of the, my favourite bits in Orlando is um, that section at, at the beginning with, with the ice fair, yeah, you know, yeah. when the Thames freezes over and, and they hold these huge fairs. Mm. Um, we didn't have enough snow for that today, no. but uh, who knows? Um, but that spectacle and display, and as you say, you know, coming right up against things, you know, translates beautifully into the and, and also a kind of a new version of virtuosity for the body. So, you know, one of the great things that ballet does is offer, a, a classical ballet does, is offer you a version of virtuosity which is within particular parameters, and audiences recognise that and like seeing that in a very particular way. And mm. we wanted to kind of like rub around the edges of what is virtuosity in a body. And for me, mm. virtuosity in a body, even in a classical domain, is one of complex coordination. It's one of um, kind of uh, feeling space rather than being inside space. It's one of understanding what's happening behind you. And so all of those kind of temperatures, um, we wanted to try and work out and create our own version of virtuosity within a classical language. Mm. Has this piece evolved between 2015 and this well, I think it's evolved because many of the dancers are older. Yeah, we're all and my, you time. know, we're all over. Time we has moved. Again. Yeah, we, yes. we've moved. And I think, I mean, I think always when you return to something, you have a deeper engagement with it in many ways mm. because there's a sense in which you already have a, a knowing about what the what the thing is and actually how you might be able to recalibrate either your performance or recalibrate the kind of the energies and the dynamics of it. Um, so yes, it'll uh, you know we'll, we'll know next week, but I think it will take on a, a kind of a, a sharper focus in many ways. Yeah. So this collaboration is obviously hugely fruitful. <laughs> Are we going to see more of it? No. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's always, you know, I, um, Max wrote a phenomenal opera called Sum that I directed here at the Opera yes. House, which is really great. We really, I think, love working in lots of different domains. I think we'd love to do a kind of a film project together. I think there's lots of really interesting things that um, are, are there yet to be done. And, um, yeah, I certainly would love to. He has to say yes. Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. Max? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course I would. Yeah. There'll be more. Mm. So, yes. Yeah. Um, just one last thing. So, um, when, when, you, when you are working together, I mean, is there, may I ask, is there <clears throat> ever any tension? <laughs> or is, is well, no, I think there are questions, and questions are interesting. You know, okay. I mean, I think it, it's about, you know, finding a sort of composite hybrid expressive object uh, and that's in my case you know I think of that really as a series of experiments and all data is good data I think you know because you're learning stuff about what you're making and you're learning you know with what the traje trajectory is all the time and I think you know you go you maybe go down a little road that doesn't go anywhere for that moment but you still sort of learn something on that. That's so true. And, and we're also, we're doing it together. It's a shared endeavour. Yes. Yeah. It's not, you know, Max delivering to me something <laughs> and me delivering something to Max. And, and then, of course, there are the dancers. There are the dancers, yeah. Everybody else. Yeah. But I think in terms of this process, what's amazing about Max is he always delivers on time. So when he says, when, and if, I mean, I, I say that not at all in a flip way, but when he says to you, I'm going to send you something on Friday, you get something on Friday. Fantastic. And uh, that's really, it's really important as these, these kind of anchors in a process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You believe Especially. you're going to get, so you don't, know what, you don't know how fully formed it is, but it doesn't matter. You get something that you can then work with that takes you a bit further in the studio, and that's really phenomenal. Well, with that encomium, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Wayne McGregor and thank Max you. Richter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You just, I'm getting Wayne to step forward because now we have to remove the chairs to reset everything for the dancers. Um, so now we are actually going to see a performance of an excerpt from Wolfworks. Um, Wayne, I'd like you to tell us yeah, what we're going to see, Yeah, we thought it'd please. be really nice because you saw the rehearsal with, um, with Amanda. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's amazing about Amanda, so, you know, in the recreation process, with these restaging processes, she's got the score, she's re-teaching all of the dancers the work, and they're inhabiting it again in a different way. And then I come back in, and then we start to re-rehearse it again. We start to find a way of making sure that's really embodied, and how is it that we can actually refine and um, make clearer some of the physical kind of attributes of body that we have and ideas in the body that we have. And so what we thought today, rather than me rehearse uh, dancers that you've seen me do so many times, I thought it would be really lovely just to have a look at um, a particular section. So I'm super lucky to have Edward Watson's with us, uh, Akane Takada and Tristan Dyer. 
Um, and we're going to we're going to share with you um, kind of one of those parallel stories. So we're sharing the story of Septimus. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about it, but only that it's partly um, Septimus' life, in the, his internal life and his exterior life that conflate at the same time. We'll have a little look at it. Fantastic. Let's Thank watch you. it. Thank you.
how, how amazing to see these three wonderful artists bring such amazing choreography to life in this studio. What a privilege. I just thank you to all three of you. Thank you very much. A huge thank you to everybody that made this insight uh, come to life tonight, and especially to Wayne McGregor. Um, Wolfworks is really part of our celebration of Wayne McGregor's 10th anniversary as resident choreographer of the Royal Ballet. How lucky are we to have a creative artist of his generosity, his collabor collaboration with so many different people, and to really make sure that the Royal Ballet looks forward. So we thank him with all our heart. Thank you, Wayne. One, one last reminder, 21st of January, we open here with Wolfworks and then at a cinema near you on the 8th of February. So be there. And I'd just like to say thank you to our audience here at The Claw and also to all of you out there on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>